Welcome to episode six of the Birmingham Sports Podcast. Uh, it's myself, Ethan, with Russ and Gunner, and as you can see, we have a special guest, Chandler Hoffman, number nine for the Legion, Birmingham native. What's going on, man? Not much. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, was it? What's quarantine life for you been like? I've actually been enjoying it uh, as much as I can. Uh, my wife and I are like settled into our house now. So we've been building a garden in the backyard. I got like uh, some nice space to be able to do some training by myself and uh, playing some video games and then taking classes at UCLA. So staying pretty busy, actually. Nice. Good to hear. Nice. But uh, no, yeah, I- so quarantine's going good. Let's just jump right into it. I want to like back up. I know, Russ, you want to talk about way back in the day, your Oak Mountain days, you know, uh, what I have down, you know, obviously you won state championships, Gatorade player of the years, you know, but Russ, you want to dive into that? Um, well, I th- I always think it's an interesting little tidbit that you and I were both Oak Mountain athletes. Um, one of us obviously more successful than the other one. Uh, um. But what was your experience like at Oak Mountain um, as Oak Mountain athlete? Just talk about it a little bit. If there were any issues uh, in re- any, like, I guess, hardships in recruiting since Oak Mountain. I know it's not considered a very high profile high school in our state because I know I had a few issues with that when I was uh, getting, recruited for la- getting recruited for lacrosse. And just, I guess, I guess your athletic experience there, if you have any fun stories from Oak Mountain and just your overall time there. Yeah, so I actually went to Briarwood until seventh grade. Um, and the club team that I was playing on, like all my buddies went to Oak Mountain. So for me, I was like always like badgering my parents to like let me transfer to Oak Mountain. Um, so eighth grade, they, they, they gave in and I had to sit out a year for sports because of the transfer rules. So then my freshman year when I got to Oak Mountain High School, um, me and then uh, two other guys, Stefan and Andres, were actually on varsity, which was pretty rare at the time to have like freshmen on varsity. Um, and that 2005 team at Oak Mountain actually had won like the national championship and kind of had put Oak Mountain soccer on the map. So there was uh, like a sense of like validity at, at Oak Mountain because the other sports were struggling, especially when I was in high school. Um, and so it was like definitely a big honor to play for, uh, the varsity team as a freshman and my freshman year, we, we lost in, uh, the elite eight, the shades Valley. And so it was kind of at that point, um, especially for me and some of the younger guys, uh, where we kind of took ownership that like we had a chance to do something really special during our time at Oak mountain. Um, so we, Obviously, won back-to-back state championships after that in 2007 and 2008, which was just an incredible experience. Um, but yeah, like you were saying, the the recruiting process. When I sent, we had a kid on the team whose mom would film all the games, so that's how I made my highlight video and sent it to a bunch of schools. And a lot of the coaches, when they saw the like the YouTube video, they would email me back and they were like questioning if it was like photoshopped or something because it's just like it was like three minutes of just basically non-stop goals and some of the kids that we were playing against like had like the rec specs on or like elbow pads or something so it looks like just ridiculous some of the teams that we were playing against you know um but so that video really got me in the door so high school soccer more so than club kind of got my foot in the door with all these big colleges and then the academy started and I was able to get like to a big academy showcase and so all the coaches knew who I was and came to see me and then that's when I was actually able to play in front of them and that's when UCLA, Wake Forest, Maryland, North Carolina, like all the big schools were like all right this guy's legit like it's not just like he's playing against his cousins in Alabama or something like that because that was kind of the method you know like message from the coaches it's like is Alabama like they actually have like legit players or like what's going on and so um, I think a lot of times, like you're saying, people can get overlooked or have difficulties because, like, they don't realize that there are actually good players and good talent in the state. Yeah, and I want to piggyback off that real quick because I, I believe I've read this somewhere. I could be totally wrong, and I might be off, but you were at a showcase, and 
shoot, you scored like a goal one game, and then the next game you scored two goals or something like that. And then uh, another game at the showcase, there were tons of college scouts or something. You went and scored a hat trick. Now, I could be wrong on that. Yeah, so the the first game, uh, there was probably – I had emailed – like I would sent out a ton of emails and sent out my highlight video, and so they knew the – the tournament that was going on. So the first game, there was probably like 25 coaches there and I, I score a hat trick that first game. And so then I guess word kind of spread. And then the next game, it was like 50 coaches and I score another goal. And then like the last game, it's just like a hundred coaches lined up on there. And so it went like going into that weekend, I had like some good scholarships, like UAB, New Mexico, like solid division one programs at the time. And then it was like, after that weekend, it was like every school like offered me some sort of scholarship after that weekend. So I'm glad I'm not totally off the mark with that one. <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. See, but uh, yeah, I want to talk about your Gatorade Player of the Year awards. Uh, you won two of them in 0809, I believe. Yeah. Um, was it? What is that? What do you believe helped you reach that level of competition where you were able, where you were in that position to win those? Like, you have hard work, but is there, and people, obviously, but can you elaborate on what kind of hard work you had to put in and your coaches or mentors, what they provided to you to get to that level? Yeah, I think my freshman year, we had a coach named Ryan Patrick, who I feel, like, very fortunate to have played for. He's, like, a very avid student of the game, and so sometimes in Alabama, there wasn't the best coaching growing up, but I was fortunate to have like very good coaches. And after him, I had Justin Pratt who had played like professional at the USL pro level, which is what it was called back then. Um, so I had two coaches that were really knowledgeable. And I think what helped me the most was I always had like big dreams of being a professional player and to have people that were knowledgeable to believe in you, I think is a huge part of it. Because it's one thing to just think you can do something, but it's another thing when you have people that you respect and value say, yeah, you have what it takes to play professional soccer. And so having the validation from them and the belief um, that I had already, it really pushed me to like keep working harder because it's like these people believe in me. My family's like sacrificed a lot, taking me to tournaments all over the place. It's like I need to reward all this belief. And then... Um, just the the fortunate to play at a school like Oak Mountain where we had so many good players and we had a great field and great resources. Um, all those things added together to give me the best chance to be successful. And then um, I was able to perform and ultimately uh, really have an incredible high school career. Now, nice. you were you were growing up in Birmingham in an era where soccer was still developing. I mean, it's still developing today, obviously. But um, but how have you, um, from your perspective, observed changes in the high school game or at the club level at um, at the high school level for high schoolers who maybe want to go and get recruited by big name schools um, in your time growing up as a high schooler? And then in the modern day, what changes have you observed? I think it's kind of crazy because uh, when you look at some of the guys that have come from Birmingham in uh, recent years, like even Tanner Tessman recently at FC Dallas. Um, he was just like a little kid when I was going off to UCLA. And when I was playing in my early pro days, I would always see him out at like Herdmont Park. Um, and then obviously to have a guy like Chris Richards from the Birmingham area. And then um, it's crazy to see just the amount of players that are like actually on like a global level you know it's not like oh we just have players going to play at top division one schools you have guys that are being looked at by some of the best teams in the world so I think that aspect has definitely changed because when I was in high school it was like not are you going to go pro it was like are you going to go to a solid division one school and so now seeing like the landscape kind of shift you have like the top players thinking about how can I get to like the best academies in the world or how can I get to the best professional team in the world? So I think from that aspect, I've seen a big shift. Um, but I think club soccer in general is kind of like in shambles just across the country. I mean, you look recently at the closing of the development Academy. Um, so I just think there has to be a better way. And I, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I feel like us soccer has kind of been all over the place in, 
recent years with trying to coordinate a way to produce talent. And um, going off of that, uh, ultimately, after your high school career uh, came to an end, you chose UCLA. You wanted to become a Bruin. Uh, obviously, you were recruited, as you mentioned before, by some some big schools on a national level. What made you fall in love with LA, and what made you want to go out there and join that program? I always wanted to be a professional player, and so I was looking at the colleges that had produced the most pros, and at the time, it was UCLA. So that was like the number one thing for me. And then we had gone out there for a tournament when I was 13 or 14, and just Southern California, like all the lights from Hollywood and then beautiful weather and the beaches. It was like, man, if I could go here, this would be incredible. So then to see it actually become a possibility, I was like, this is something I have to do. And um, I'm sure other guys are going to talk more about your college career, but if you could pick one moment, and I mean, I know there are a bunch. um, I've watched a ton of your YouTube videos and just seeing, you know, the hat trick against UCSB and moments like that. Uh, if you could pick one, what would your favorite memory be from the college level? From a personal standpoint, it would definitely be that game against Santa Barbara because at the time we were both ranked in the top five in the country. It was my junior year. Um, I had scored in a couple games before that, but then that game, scoring that hat trick against them to win three to two, it made like becoming a professional player like very tangible because. I was on the map previously for Generation Adidas and stuff. And then that game, it's like you have a really good chance to kind of uh, have an incredible year. And then from a team perspective, um, we played at Louisville in the Elite Eight. And the game went into overtime my junior year. We score a goal to, to win the game. And that put us in the Final Four, which was in Birmingham. So that kind of moment... I never thought, like, when I went out to UCLA, I would be playing meaningful college games in Birmingham. And so then to win that game and to be able to come back to Birmingham, that was, like, incredible, especially since the year before Louisville had beat us um, in the Elite Eight. So it was like a revenge game, and we got to come to Birmingham. What is it? I want to back up a little bit before, uh, what is it? You said UCLA, Wake Forest, uh, UNC, and shoot, I already forgot the other one. Maryland. Yeah, what uh Maryland. Is there any was there any point that you were like set on shoot, how did I word this right? UCLA, okay. Were you set on that from the beginning? Or were you weighing your options? Like everybody weighs their options, but my point is, was your heart set on UCLA or were you looking at Maryland or UNC heavily just as much as UCLA? I was pretty set on UCLA, but my parents were like we really want to like you to explore your options. They wanted me to stay on the East coast. Obviously it's easier for them to get the games and stuff like that. And so when we went to Maryland, um, their coach, Sasha, Sasha, Sasha Sarofsky, he's like a really like convincing, like charismatic guy. And so he kind of got us in the office and was like, all right, we need like your verbal commitment. Like we see you as being like the guy for us for the next couple of years And he like rolled out the red carpet for uh, like how he saw me as being a part of the program and stuff. And they had done really well. They had had AJ De La Garza and Omar Gonzalez and had won national championships. And so there was definitely like that uh, kind of pressure and desire to like appease my parents, obviously, and then like um, play for a program like that because they had a really cool uh game day experience with the college it was real intimate with the fans and uh maryland soccer was like a big deal um and so there was definitely like some thought at that point but then once we visited ucla and i was on campus i was like this is where i'm supposed to be moving over to this where i where i really enjoy following pro athletes the pro level obviously you know you were drafted uh was it 13th overall by Philly Uh, first Alabama native selected in the first round of the MLS draft. Take me through what you were feeling that moment that you got drafted. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize, and I definitely didn't realize it. um, When you're sitting in the draft room, your whole life is about to change. Like I know people say that, but it's like, this is an actual moment where depending on what happens in the next hour 
will determine pretty much like where you're going to live, what your life could potentially look like. So when I was in that draft, I had um, met with some coaches previously. I, I had spoken with my agent, but as I was sitting there, like I was pretty much aware as anyone else, because it was on ESPN two at the time. And, and you had no idea like if you were going to get drafted or not until like Don Garber called the names out. So there were like potential like Jay Heaps was at New England at the time. They had the fifth pick and they were interested actually in picking me. So like when the fifth pick came up, I thought there would be a possibility. There was like LA Galaxy was interested in me, but they weren't until 19th. So I knew there would be some space in there. So from basically five to 19 after New England didn't pick me, I, I had no clue like what was going to happen. And so then when Philly picked me, I had not talked to the coach. I had not done anything. And then it's like, wow, Philadelphia just picked me. And then you're walking up on stage and you're like talking about how Philadelphia picked you. And like, you really don't know much about the city, like the coaching staff. It was, it's wild. Yeah. Going into it, what is it? You just mentioned Jay Heaps. So were you talking to how, how far back does that relationship go? Like the draft process, if you talk to him then or. So they had, at the time, they had the MLS Combine down in Florida, down in Fort Lauderdale. And so you play a couple games, um, do some testing stuff, kind of like the NFL Combine. And then you have meetings a lot with the coaches. So when I was there, I actually spoke with Jay. And basically, they're interviewing guys to see if they think they'll be a good match for like their culture and the locker room and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I had four or five interviews down there and jay was one of the people that i interviewed with so that was back in 2000 january 2012 that's kind of cool i bet uh what is it who would have known you would have been playing for a usl <laughs> championship team in, in birmingham and jay heaps is here right yeah you could never even guess it at that time you know you could i'd like you to speak a little more about that too because you've had success at both levels in professional soccer um obviously but You've been all over the place. You've been in Philadelphia, uh, Houston, Louisville, just to name a few. Um, and you, you, when you were first, when you heard the news of the Legion coming to existence back in 2018, or maybe the later part of 2017 when first news broke, um, and then when you first heard from Jay Heaps, uh, you were impressed with his vision and the how he wanted to have a competitive team and bringing in some really good guys and, you know, uh, good management, obviously, but speak about what really drew you back to Birmingham and why you wanted to join the Legion and play for a professional soccer team in your home city. Yeah, so 2017, I had like a really good year with uh, the Monarchs, and about halfway through the year, I think it was summertime at some point in 2017, the USL released that Birmingham was awarded a franchise. And so I initially thought, oh, this must be for League One or what, what's now League One. I was like, um, that's going to be really cool. Like Birmingham's going to have a team that's really cool. And then I started reaching out to some people that knew a little bit more. And they were like, no, this is going to be like in the championship. Like this is going to be like the, the top tier, like below MLS. Like I was like, whoa, this is really cool. I need to find out more details about that. And so they hired Morgan Copes kind of as the first employee because obviously um, he was a huge part in getting the Legion here. Um, and so I knew Morgan from the Hammers days and I tried to support the Hammers whenever I was in town to go out and like watch their summer games or whatever I could whenever I was in town. And so I reached out to Morgan and told him, like I didn't want to do it just like because I was from Birmingham, but if they were like serious about like having a team in the league that was going to compete and win and do things the right way. Like I 100% wanted to come back and be a part of it. And so once I spoke with him and found out who the owners were and that they were going to treat it as a professional team, not like uh, where we're just getting players from Atlanta or whatever, where it's just loan players or where it's viewed as minor league. Um, that's when I was like, I really want to be here and be a part of this. And I'm sure that's how we felt, too, three of us as huge Legion fans now. Um, just that chance to watch professional soccer at the second tier level in the U.S. is something really special for us as fans. And I'm sure it's special for players, too. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I hate that the the season got postponed um, because you could see the kind of momentum that we had going in. Like if you look at that first game against Atlanta United too, that atmosphere is really, really special. And I think this year, not having to start from scratch, already having the framework kind of built, there's um, a much better starting point as far as the product on the field. I think last year, obviously the, the injury against NCFC was, you know, put a damper on your season, your personal accomplishments for the year. But if you could pick, and I know it's hard not to say Hartford, if you could pick your favorite goal scored uh, for the Legion so far, what would you say? Yeah, for me, the the special one was the first one when we played at Louisville because it was my old club. They were the reigning champions. We had started the year off poorly, Pretty much going into that game, everyone had written us off like Louisville's going to win for sure. And to score that goal and then to win uh, away at Louisville was a huge result. And um, it was special to, to score that first goal for, for the Legion in, in my career. And going off of that, I've always wanted to ask you this. Could you explain your uh, celebration after that goal of the hands going up? Yeah, so... A lot of times, like you see guys that when they've played for a club, they they don't celebrate. So it's like the the hands up. But when it, the ball first came across and I caught it like very cleanly and put it right where I wanted it to, like when you score, there's just a huge jolt of emotion, and especially since we had got off to a slow start. So like I wanted to celebrate very bad, but then I remembered like I wanted to be respectful of like my time at Louisville, so I just kind of put my hands up in the air, but. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of what happened there. Yeah, I know. What is it? You guys are supposed to play in Lynn Stadium. Uh, shoot, I think you were the first visitors from the championship supposed to play there. What would you have done if you would have scored the first ever goal in that stadium? <laughs> that would have been amazing. I, I don't think the fans would have been too happy uh, for Louisville City, but yeah, it's going to be amazing to see what that stadium is actually like because I've seen some of the guys that I know that play there that have done throughs and stuff and it looks incredible and supposedly they have the lights that are going to change colors the led lights um so i think it'll be a really really special stadium there yeah i was i was looking forward i was trying to go visit there for the game you know and i was so hyped but whenever that came out i was like dang gotta (laughs) wait a little bit but yeah and uh i wanted to uh, ask you real quick just when you first stepped on the pitch for the Legion, when you came back, what was what was going through your mind when you first walked out on the pitch against uh, Bethlehem Steel? Uh, seeing the stadium full, hearing the crowd, just I guess was it a realization that, like I'm back in my hometown, this is real now, or like what was going through your mind? Yeah, it was a surreal moment. I had kind of envisioned it, like and tried to imagine what it would feel like, but actually stepping back after I left Birmingham basically in 2009 and then coming back 10 years later 2019 playing in the first ever game at home um it was one of those moments that I'll like have for the rest of my life you know it's really really special and to be able to represent actually like your hometown like your club is pretty cool that not not many players get to do that yeah uh, all right do you guys guys have any more on uh legion because i have i have some personal style related questions that we could get to next but ethan i think you have something else i got i got two more things two more and then we'll move on um what is it first off we didn't touch on this and as in the background, as in your background, Chandler, it'd be a disrespectful thing not to. Uh, LA Galaxy, you're an MLS champion. Uh, we didn't even touch on that, I don't think, earlier. But finally getting to that top level in America and winning the highest achievement in America, you know, the MLS Cup, what did that feel like? That whole season, you played with great players. Uh, I mean, just take us through that real quick, like a little two-minute breakdown of that whole season. Yeah, so at the beginning of 2013, it was right before uh, the season was about to start, I get a call. um, I knew that it was in the works, but then I get a call from Bruce Arena, and he says like that they've traded for me um, and that he was excited to have me be a part of the Galaxy organization. 
and I was at my friend's uh, house at the time, and I actually like ran and did like a knee slide, uh, like because I was so excited to go back to LA and to be able to be a part of like literally one of the best teams in North America. It was like something that seemed like a dream. And so to be able to play with guys like Robbie Keane for me, because in Philly in 2012, um, I was competing for playing time and stuff, but there was no one to really learn from. You know, I'm, I was a first year pro and the other guys on the team were like Danny Mwanga, who was the same age as me, Jack McInerney, who was younger than me. So there was no like really established striker to, to learn from at the time. And so to be able to have Robbie Keane, Landon Donovan, those guys to be able to see on a day day to day basis, like you can't, there's no money you could put on like that experience. Um, and so then in 2014, um, to like in my time with the galaxy, I got to play against Real Madrid, AC Milan, Juventus. It's just like Manchester United, Real Madrid. Like, it's just, it's crazy. Like, it's crazy. Like you're walking out on the field in front of like, when we were at the Rose Bowl, I think it was 90,000 or 80 something thousand people. And you're walking out and there's Wayne Rooney or like uh, Real Madrid, there's Cristiano. It's like a- actual living like legends, you know, that you're getting to take the field with. So that was special. And then to win MLS Cup, which is the biggest trophy you can win in the U.S., it's a feeling you can't really describe because it's like a whole year of effort and concentration and like belief in what you're doing. And then it all culminates with a championship and you get to celebrate together with players that you used to watch on TV growing up. It's like, man, I can't believe that this is the point that I'm at. Like those two years, 2013, 2014 were just from a professional standpoint, like you couldn't have imagined a better setup as far as the team that I was playing on the living situation, just everything as a whole was just kind of incredible. That's awesome. I have one question and I don't think we touched on this with Ben. I meant to, but I didn't the whole BCFC thing. I know you ended up signing a Jersey. If I recall correctly, sending it over to one of their supporters that was so organic. And so out of nowhere, like, you just wake up one day, you know, and you see all this stuff. What what was going through your head? Because going through my head was, what is happening? <laughs> yeah, you look um, after the Atlanta United um, preseason game, and then the Birmingham Legion mentions were just going nuts. And, like, I posted uh, something about the jersey giveaway, and it was, like, the impressions were over, like, 40,000 on that one tweet. And it was just crazy to see like you were saying something organic because it wasn't like the clubs like forced it or anything like that it was literally like the fans just kind of making it happen which i think that's the best way to build like a culture and a fan base and anything like that even friendships it's like when it's not forced it's just organic and so to see the support it would have been really interesting because i feel like once we started playing games that you would have seen people in England staying up late watching our games and like keeping up with us and it would have just given us a whole different like scope of uh fans and interactions uh between teams so explain a little bit about the rivalry with Memphis we knew it was there from the start but how now after BCFC has you know their fans joining in with it and just all the comments on social media from a player's perspective how much more does that make you just want to go to Memphis and just, you know, have a 4 0 win? Yeah. I mean, I think after the literally thousands and thousands of comments, there's a responsibility as players to kind of back up uh, yeah. all the, the talk that we're better than Memphis and things like that. And um, so I think there will be a definitely. Um, higher stakes in that game because there has been so much talk on social media and and people uh going back and forth so i think there will definitely be that added uh sense of like urgency in the game for sure you want to move on to your style questions now or russ you got Uh, something yeah russ anything i just wanted to comment how uh 
I once, whenever the uh, season does start back up, um, I can't wait for the Memphis game because remember, I remember uh, I was at the uh, home game against Memphis last year. I think that was one of the few times where the crowd that night, as far as intensity went, may have surpassed the home opener. Like that, I've never seen a more vicious Birmingham crowd in my entire time there at UAB, uh, going to Barons games, going to Bulls games. That was the most vicious. Birmingham crowd I've ever been a part of, and it was amazing. Yeah, I think with the localness of their club and um, the ability of fans to be able to get back and forth to games, I feel like when we play there, they play here, that there's going to be like, because there's something special when it's like a stadium where there's at least another fan base. You know, it's different where it's just like it's all one team where um if you have like that localness you're able to bring some of your fans and they're able to bring some of their fans and so it kind of like feeds into the energy of the game and the energy of the stadium oh yeah oh yeah and i want to i want to mention one more thing that just came to my head um one thing that the bcfc fans were going at uh memphis for was playing in a baseball stadium and i just wanted to get your thoughts because you played in louisville uh slugger field baseball stadium what is it like playing on a baseball field compared to an actual soccer field like bbva yeah that's not even the same at all like at at louisville and like even their owners their coaches their players they all know it as well Um, that's just not how the game is meant to be played um like when we were playing like one half of the field like where the baseball uh infield was there's like this crazy slick turf so like if you're running and you try to cut or change directions it's like you would just slide or there there'd be chances in games where it's like the other team the guy's trying to clear the ball and he just slides and loses his footing um and that's just to me not how it's supposed to be played you know the games just needs to be on in my opinion like a grass surface and uh made for the beautiful game not uh kind of just thrown together on a baseball field Oh, yeah. All right. Now, if you guys are okay with it, and Chandler, obviously, you can speak on this as much as you would like to. Um, From watching some of those videos on YouTube, I've noticed that you're a bit of a sneakerhead. And I've I've observed your collection that, you know, includes some personal favorites of mine, you know, the Yeezy Turtle Loves and the the Gamma Blue 11s. Yeah. Could could you speak on the current status of your collection what are you uh adding to your collection or do you have any do you have any sneakers you'd like to add to your collection um i haven't added any recently now that i am uh married and a homeowner like (laughs) my my shoe purchases are are not what they used to be when i was younger and uh single but um the the one pair that like I had kind of always wanted was like the the off white with the the Nike like the connection that they had um, like one of the pairs from uh, I'd, I'd have to look it up to to show. Would it be the, the Air Force One? The Air Force One, yeah. Now, which color though? Because you have a bunch of options like with the neon green or the orange. Which one would you find best? The, the orange one was the one that like I had wanted in the past for sure. Um. Yeah, because they no with Off White they've done some absolutely insane stuff, and some of the designs I feel like it's a little much for just you know your normal person walking down the right. street. But some of them, I mean, you got to respect that that concept because they look really really neat. Yeah. And uh, the other thing I wanted to ask, and this is kind of mixing in another Birmingham sports team, I always see you repping the Magic City Barons jersey. Yeah. Is that your favorite Barons jersey? Because I mean, they have a ton of collabs and specialty nights. Would you prefer that one over the pinstripes or the red? And could you just explain about your, you know, the significance that the Barons are? And as as someone originally from Birmingham, are you a fan? I mean, yeah, speak about that. Well, that's what's been really cool for me. Kind of another full circle thing is growing up. Like until pretty much I broke my wrist when I was like twelve. I was obsessed with baseball. I loved baseball. So I would go to the Hoover Met, watch the Barons play. When Michael Jordan was here, I would go try to get my dad dad to take me to like every game. And now we're actually training out at the Hoover Met. So we walk through the baseball stadium every day when we're um going out to training and our locker room is where the Barons uh 
locker room was. So it's just wild that all these years later, now I'm in that locker room. Um, but yeah, the Magic City one I thought was really, really cool. I threw out the first pitch at the game um, when I came back in, uh, in July of 2018 uh, for the big announcement. And um, I do, I, I love the, the Barron's pinstripe one as well. I wanted to get like the, I can't remember what it was called, but like the, I wanted to get a Michael Jordan one, the, the Barron's one, but I just never got around to getting it. See, I have the pinstripes, and I feel like that's a look you cannot go wrong with with a baseball jersey. It's yeah, so it's, hard to mess up pinstripes. Yeah, it's classic. Yeah, I want to. What is it, Gunner? I think you guys been this whenever we, whenever we talk to him. Okay, we might be throwing someone under the bus here. I don't think Ben answered it, but best and worst dressed on the team. Best and worst dressed. Um. Yeah, that's that's definitely going to be throwing someone under the bus. Yeah, ben, ben was really hesitant to answer because he didn't want to throw anyone under the bus. Yeah. Um, let's see. How about we rephrase it and say who has the most intriguing, interesting that's, style? That, that's yeah. what Ben did. He re, he changed question entirely on us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think you've definitely seen like Mikey will wear some crazy stuff at times like he loves like especially with shoes like any of the nike shoes that are like incredibly colorful like that's what that's what he's going for uh matt van okel definitely has like the dad look you know like just the american dad style (laughs) um by the way did you guys see his uh instagram story last night where he did his uh his tiger king post with his shirt off yes <laughs> yeah he is just a hilarious guy what's it what's it like playing with him because i mean the fans see how much of a character he is with anything from just you know being an awesome goalie to the donuts to everything what's it like actually being a teammate of his yeah i think that sums it up is he's just a character you know he's always looking to make guys laugh but then when it's time for a business he's just super serious and uh like he's a very, like a presence in the goal. That's the way I would definitely describe him. Um, but yeah, like in the locker room or on his Instagram, he's just a character. Yeah, what is it? The Instagram. I remember he was doing that Instagram live on the Legion's page this morning, and somebody asked him when when are the stories coming back? You know, he goes live and does the stories because he hasn't done them in like 20 days or something and everybody was calling for him calling him out on the live stream so he's like okay this weekend i'm doing it <laughs> but the will you be participating in the mikey lopez challenge with your hair that matt started <laughs> i will not be participating in that. uh that's funny matt though he's he's such a character like i've never met him or talked to him but just seeing him at Legion games, you know, from afar, he's got that loud, broad voice and the way he interacts with people uh, in real life and as Tiger King on his Instagram. It's just amazing because that dude is, I mean, I feel like it's a joy to be around him. He brings so much happiness and such. Whereas on the field, he looks like a big monster in goal that just yeah. hacks everything down. Especially when the head is shaved and the beard right. is just in the full length. Full. He was talking at one point last year about shaving the beard. I was like, he cannot, like, he can shave. no way. I think, I mean, you have to think that would hurt his confidence, too. I mean, that is like what fuels <laughs> right. him. That, that in itself makes some saves by itself, you know, yeah. just the fact of having that. What is it on the Instagram live this morning, too? I'm refer back to it because somebody said, dye the beard next. And he like, <laughs> I might have to do that. And then somebody said, frost the I'm beard. I'm going to tell him to do that. I'm going to yeah. encourage that. <laughs> that was fun, though. So, oh. I mean, Russ, you got anything you want to ask? Just one uh, question as far as, like, the locker room goes. Who's the most, uh, I guess, fun teammate in, like, in the locker room? Who brings the most, like, joy to the locker room? Um, well, I think there's, like, some different characters. Uh, Anderson Asidu is hilarious. <laughs> uh, so he, like, is somebody that will just – like always has like a catchphrase or something or, or something to say that will make everyone laugh. Um, and then I really, I love Daigo. Uh, I feel like whenever he speaks, it's just, 
he's always got like a lot of wisdom, but like just he says it in very funny ways. And uh, yeah, it's just like the, the group of guys that we have on the team is, is a really good group of guys. And um, like Mikey and Brian are always just like dissing each other, saying funny things like that. Um, so it's, it's a good mix of guys and uh, they keep like the, the locker room full of laughs. Yeah, I think oh, Daigo yeah. is, uh, I can see him being the wisdom guy because I remember Gunner, whenever the binge watching shows came out for you guys, yeah. like uh, the Legion put up that whole article about what shows you guys like to watch during quarantine. Was it Daigo said? I don't uh, watch TV. Yeah, and it's Gunner said in the chat extent. and we all busted out laughing. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. You mentioned Brian Wright, and I want to ask this because I noticed this in one of your videos. There's a there's a little clip. Um, I think this is when you were injured, but you were filming one of the training sessions. DJ and Brian come over and hit a woe in front of the camera. Could you speak on, I mean, do, do you like that? Do you think that, that they should improve their dance moves before they do that on camera? Or what's your opinion on that? Well, DJ was a guy uh, in the locker room that was hilarious, like, the skinny white dude, but he loved like dancing, loved hip hop music. Obviously, he's very into fashion, um, tattoos all over the place. He had actually a thing where he said he would get anything tattooed if someone paid for it. So if they wanted him to get a tattoo, as long as they paid for it, he's like, I'll get the tattoo. Wow. Um, so he was, he was a guy that was super funny. And last year, also Tyler Turner. Um, him and DJ loved dancing. So between uh, Tyler Turner, DJ, and Brian, there was always dancing like going on in the locker room. Now, did anyone take up DJ on his offer with the tattoos? I, I don't think any of the guys on the Legion did, but I know like a lot of people that he's played with in the past. A lot of the tattoos he has are literally people picked them out and paid for them, and he got them. Dang. I don't know if I'd be willing to do that. That's that's <laughs> yeah. bold. That is very bold. Yeah, and uh, what is it? I want to ask you this question because it's a very intriguing question. I asked uh, Jay this a while, a couple of weeks ago, but he he set out a plan. And I asked the question, where do you see the Legion in three years? And he said, more so than on the field play, we want to win champions and championships, obviously. But off the field play, the community around Birmingham coming together to support the Legion. My question to you is, where do you see the Legion in three years? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for me, I would love to see, like, from a player's perspective, um, the home games, the kind of atmosphere that we had against Atlanta United. I know that's, like, um, not going to happen with the weather and whatever, but that would be the goal for me is that more often than not we have, like, full stadiums and we're putting on, like, a product on the field that the fans can be proud of. Um and then I think like Jay was saying, just kind of the recognition of the Legion within the community as a whole, you know, that um, the Legion is, is helping the community and the community's backing the Legion and just kind of, um, especially the local club soccer scene, that they continue to grow that aspect so that kids realize, hey, there is a professional team in Birmingham that I can support. It's not like this lower level, like something that is like, not a big deal but that they see it as like oh this is something really cool um that i have the opportunity to go to and actually interact with professional players and and things like that yeah that's a good answer i that's a question i'm gonna post to everybody now because i think it's such an intriguing question you know yeah absolutely like, and different answers from everybody but it seems like it always comes back to community and the community the legion have sought out to build which is awesome from playing on a lot of different teams now, I've been able to see like the difference when a team is actually connected, when they're like, they're actually like putting action behind what they're saying. Like the Legion legitimately wants to be in connection with the community. It's not like just something that they're writing to look trendy or something like that. They legitimately want to be connected to the community. That's good. Russ, I'll and, let you go. Oh yeah, go ahead, um, Russ. I, I had a question piggybacking off, like, I guess, where do you see the Legion in three years? Uh, it's more of, I guess, a, a stadium question. 
I know that uh, the team has a lease with BBVA, BBVA Field for, I think it was seven or eight years. And I was wondering, I guess, from a player's, player's perspective, uh, whenever that lease is up, would you rather see the team move into a protective stadium, like I've heard it's been discussed, uh, build a team-specific stadium on like a different in a different part of the city, or would you like to see the team, I guess, renew its lease at uh, BBVA Field? What do you think uh, would be a good move for that? I think for the players personally, like when you have between five to. 11,000 fans like somewhere in that range you want it to be like small and intimate you like like when we played indy 11 last year like indy 11 typically gets between like what, whatever six to ten thousand people depending on the game in the colt stadium it feels completely empty it feels like there's like no one there because the stadium is so massive so it just overwhelms the the actual fans that are there so I think depending on how the Legion grows, which hopefully continues to get more and more fans, I think the better options would be either add more seating to BBVA or um, figure out a way if they do move into the new stadium to make it intimate and compact, not where it's like a couple hundred fans here, a couple hundred fans here, just spread out all over the place because then there's no like energy being that the players can feed off of because it's just, it feels dead. Oh yeah. I feel it. And I have two more short questions and you just reminded me of one of them by mentioning Lucas oil. Um, your favorite stadium to play in at a USL level. Ooh, at a USL level. Um, I loved when I was on, um, the West coast, when we would play at Sac Republic, um, we had some really, really big games there. Um, and when I was on Galaxy 2, we were in the semifinals of uh, the USL playoffs. And it was just a packed house. Um, we ended up losing that game, but it was just like an amazing atmosphere for the uh, USL. And then the game where we played against FC Cincinnati when I was at Louisville at the time, it was the biggest crowd in USL history. Um, and so that was like a really, really cool environment. And the other thing I wanted to ask, and we basically end up discussing this on every single podcast, the kits, the Legion kits, your favorite to play in. Because, we, I mean, the Sweet Home one just came out. You have the cleanest looks with the white and then the black. What's your personal favorite? I loved like the, the all black kits. Um, it's hard to say that like, red ones now because it's like we only got to play in them one game you know so um but i love like the all black because i typically like typically wear black cleats so i love like the black with the black with the black cleats i feel like that looks like really clean for sure oh living up to the boys in black nickname yeah (laughs) yeah well uh what is it any final thoughts from anybody before we wrap this up Good for my um, end. Good for my end, yeah. All right, you want to plug anything, Chandler? You got any projects in the works or just college so far? Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to get the the YouTube channel back up and running. Um, I'm wanting to do more, like, because uh, I told you I was interested in going into coaching, so I want to give some stuff that's easy for kids to, to learn and watch and enjoy. So um, definitely be on the lookout for that in the next couple months. And what's the channel name? Uh, Chan and Jew is the name. Sweet. I uh, I think that's pretty much it. We appreciate you joining us on episode, what is it, six now? Episode six. Episode six, yeah. It's flying by. Well, we really appreciate you. We really do uh, appreciate it, man. We this really is, appreciate you, man. For us and, I mean, we can't thank you enough for joining us for this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, be sure to check us out on Instagram, Twitter, what is it, shoot, Spotify, YouTube now, and website coming. So, uh, Yeah, and that's been episode six of the Birmingham Sports Podcast. Thanks for listening. See you later.